with this trip, special moments. Uh, here we are, I think we've talked about the sunrise. This will be the third Wednesday night in a row. Uh, of course, when we, when we uh, take vacations and trips, especially when we go west, we're always interested in, uh, we, we see as many sunrises and sunsets as we can. Uh, and it just, boy, it really helps us to put things in perspective and realize what all, helps us to realize what all God does for us. We're going to start this trip tonight on Mount Arbel. And this is, <laughs> this is actually a picture of a picture. Uh, this would be, oh, if I, and Marsha may correct me here because I, I was turned around uh, nearly 180 degrees while I was, at least 90 degrees while I was on Mount Arbel that day. But this would be looking back uh, uh, towards Nazareth, okay? Uh, when I was standing on Mount Arbel looking at the Sea of Galilee, and there's so many, you can see so much from up there, it would be between seven and eight o'clock over my left shoulder, you see this valley going in between the mountains. And this was the path, you might say, of least resistance, and this would be the path that Jesus walked from Nazareth to Galilee. So, uh, and, and again, as we went up to, towards, uh, walked up towards uh, Mount Arbel, uh, which is uh, about s somewhere between 12 and 1300 feet above the Sea of Galilee, okay? Now we know the Sea of Galilee is 690 feet below sea level, so it's down in a hole. And then our bell uh, is, is 1,200 feet above that, 12 to 1,300 it, it, or the figures that I read. But they had uh, pictures of several of the sites that you could see up there, and, and this was one of them. Um, and it, Mount Arbel, we're not going to find it in the Bible, uh, but we can look at Matthew chapter 4. Uh, Matthew chapter 4 and verse, I believe it's, yeah, 25. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 25, it says, And the great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. And the first verse of chapter 5 says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. This is the highest point around the Sea of Galilee, okay? Uh, we had a very special uh, prayer service, song service, and then, and then we read uh, Matthew chapter 5 through 7, uh, which would have been the Beatitudes, uh, and, and a, a very special place to do that. Uh, this mountain is on the northwest side. Let's see if I can check my shakes out here. Would be somewhere right in this area, just just below. Uh, I, I guess you could say it would be kind of almost in between uh, Magdala and uh, uh, Tiberius. Uh, the Sea of Galilee is is. Uh, Approximately, as widest point is about eight miles wide and uh, 13 miles long. There's many caves in Mount Arbel. Uh, there's many battles, and they were f for protection from the time of Herod the Great uh, uh, through the Romans. So, looking here is a picture of Magdala. Yeah, I mentioned it. It would be looking. Uh, what would you say, Marsha? Northwest uh, from the top of Mount Arbel. Um, historical tradition says that this is the site of Jesus giving the Great Commission, uh, Matthew chapter twenty-eight, uh, the last instructions that he left for his disciples. Uh, 
We talked about the way to, to uh, Nazareth. Nazareth was about 40 miles away, distance of about 40 miles. Um, from this site, you could see Magdala, uh, Tiberias. Uh, that's, that's a long way away from here, but right in that area is where we're talking about being right now. Uh, but you could see across to the north, you could see uh, Gennesar. And, and this is a place, when we're looking down, this is a place where Christ called many of his apostles, uh, many disciples. We see here, we see here in the last verse of chapter 4 and the first verse of chapter 5, uh, how large the crowds are. And we've talked several times uh, during this trip about the importance of high places getting up. And we'll, we'll see a, a lot of the communities are built up on the sides of hills. Um, close to water and elevation. Uh, you can see uh, Chorazin to the north. Uh, you can see Capernaum to the north. Bethsaida to the north. Uh, and you can see where Christ fed the 5,000 uh, and the 4,000. That's in uh, the 5,000 is spoken of in Matthew chapter 14, verses uh, 13 through 21, and fed the 4,000. Matthew chapter 15, verses uh, 32 through 38. Cursey, uh, you can see Cursey. You can also see, if you remember. Uh, Last week was it last week or the week before last? The week before last, when when uh, Christ walked on water. What was he crossing the Sea of Galilee for? The week before last, we we were looking at at the man that was a demon-filled man that Christ was headed towards. Okay, a great storm came up. Uh, we need to uh, we'll look at that. Uh, uh, a very beautiful sight. I, I, talking to Tim, I don't, I don't know where Tim is tonight, but oh, that's right, he speaks at West Hill tonight. Forgot about that. I, I've told Tim in conversation that there's some, some of these places we went were, I don't know how to say it other than special. Some of them, you just, the hair would stand up on your neck and arms while you were there. And some of them, it was hard to keep from crying, uh, get, uh, be very emotional about. This is one of those special places uh, when you could see as, as much as you could see of Galilee, not only the sea, but that uh, Galilean area, and know how many steps that Christ took and how many people he brought to the truth uh, in this area it was just uh, made it a very very special place yes it's referred to as sweet water sweet water right? and, and it but it is it is fresh water um, yeah, this this picture would be looking more. Uh, I guess it'd be looking more west. No, be looking east. Be looking east. See how I get turned around. As this is, I know this is early morning. It's what made me correct myself there because we, Marsh is looking into the sun here. So, okay, when we when we got down, we I don't know, uh, we spent probably three hours or better up on Mount Arbel. But when we got down and got down on the sea, we got on a fishing boat. This is the only picture I have of that. I mean, we we again had a had, took a boat ride out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, 
and we had a fishing exhibit that went on. Uh, no fish were caught and the net was lost. <laughs> so I, I would not consider it to be a very successful fishing trip, but it, the guy did show traditionally how they cast those nets, and the, and of course they were tied to their wrists. He he told us he said the day before he caught a real nice fish, and it was really neat. Everybody got to see that, but he started started to pull this one in, and all at once it jerked and broke the the deal off of his arm and lost the net and everything. So we don't know if it was a big fish or, or what it was, but, but he lost the whole rig. Um, Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. We'll, we'll read that. Mark chapter 4. Verses 35 through 31. It says, On that day when the evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as, uh, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep, on a cushion, and they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? Now, I felt it important to read this because this next photograph is the remnants of a first century boat. Now they had, from what I can understand, they had a drought. This, was, this boat was located in the uh, Genesar Boat Museum and, and it's located between, uh, uh, between Magdala and Capernaum. And this picture does not do it justice. I, I apologize for this. If I had to guess how long that was, it was in the neighborhood of 30, 35 feet, something like that long. And of course, this is just the bottom of it. It's mostly made out of oak and cedar. But when they tested it, it had nine other types of wood in it in patches, repairs. So evidently it was an old boat uh, dating back to the first century. Hey, could have been the boat that Christ was in. <laughs> we don't know. But they, they did do the uh, uh, carbon-14 testing and it did test to be 2,000 years old. Now as they uncovered it, from the sand, from this drought, as it dried out, it started to just deteriorate, just to fall, uh, fall all to pieces. Now, I think you can see around the edges probably what was happening there as it dried from top towards the bottom, it just would dis disintegrate. And they had a, some kind of method that they came up with and encapsulated that thing in there's some kind of chemical they, that they injected into that wood that caused it to hold its form. So they could get it up and get it to this location in this museum. Uh, really neat to see. Um, I mean, it's uh, uh, to think about something being buried there in that sand on that shore that long. So evidently, in the first century, uh, as many patches as this boat had on it, it must it, evidently at some point in time it was given up on and it sank right there. And then, and then uh, through uh, all of those years, it was completely covered up, completely buried. The next stop was in Magdala. Yeah. 
while we were out in the Sea of Galilee. Now, I, I kind of joke, and every time Marcia says something like that, I say, yeah, it was, it was in between them selling T-shirts and jewelry <laughs> on the fish. But it, it was a family-owned boat, and uh, they had a good rapport. There had been this group, or, or they had carried John and Carla and their group out several times because they, they knew them well and, and uh, uh, made, made arrangements and places for us to have our devos and, and to sing while we were out on the Sea of Galilee. But again, a very special moment, very special time. Magdala possibly means tower. It's a very prosperous uh, fishing village. It's the home of Mary Magdalene. Uh, there's going to be several pictures here of uh, these tile or mosaic tiles floors. And uh, we've got a wall painting here, a remnant of one uh, up here. I know, I know we've talked about the, uh, uh, the scarlet color, the red color. Here's some more. This, this was, uh, uh, of course, a... Uh, First century, these are supposed to be first century layers here, um, and that they have uh, on, on the digs, a synagogue, and of course they've got it covered to protect it uh, from this point. Um, they have constructed a new, uh, we didn't hear it called anything but a chapel, but it was a large round building that had some offices in there, a really a beautiful building, and, and we could not read them, but around the top, and we'll have a photo here in a moment, that it had names up there. And this, this building was dedicated to the women in Jesus' life, during, during his lifetime. It's mentioned in the Bible. Uh, we can look at Luke chapter 8, verses 1, 1 through 3. I'll read that to you. Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. It says, Soon afterward he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom the seven demons uh, had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of uh, Cusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. In this chapel, which uh, we sang in there also, and of course the acoustics were just, uh, it was just amazing, uh, but there were little enclaves, egresses all the way around. I can't remember if there were six or seven of them. And they would have a, I'll say this, a larger than life painting representing a time in Christ's life. Can anybody look at this picture and determine what time this was in Christ's life? You see the hand coming out to touch the garment? Mark chapter 5 and verse 25. Mark 5, 25. Mark 5, 25, and I'll read just it. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And all she wanted to do, she had, a, she had enough faith and she felt like if she could just touch his garment, she would be healed. Was she? Yes, she was. But this, this uh, table here is approximately waist high on me, if that will give you any kind of perspective about how big. Now, this is the, pretty much the top of the painting right here. 
but it, it'll give you an idea of how big the, those paintings were uh, that we saw there. This is inside. You can see around the top up here, it was just an oval roof on it. A lot of marble, a lot of granite. And then, of course, this was us. Uh, Marcia and I, Marcia's sister Donna and Nikki Newman that was with us. And of course, this is on the uh, shore of the Sea of Galilee. This is where you actually got your <laughs> little bottle of water from the Sea of Galilee. And, and the shoreline was not sand. It was just tiny, tiny little shells. Next stop is going to be Capernaum. I'm going to apologize to you before we get to these pictures. Uh, Capernaum was a very, uh, Capernaum was, they, they had Peter's house there. Now, you, when you get in some of these Bible dictionaries and things like that, they'll show you a picture of what they call Peter's house, where they, uh, and, and it's just the floor remnants of, of that first century house. And of course, Christ lived with him while he was there for, we don't know how long, but for so, some time. And, and I, I actually found a picture of it, just like it would have looked. But today, they have constructed a, a big, uh, very nice synagogue right on top of it, but it's on stilts, where you can walk around and inspect the floor plan uh, on these digs. But then you can go in this beautiful building, go up the stairs, go in this beautiful building, and right in the center of it is a glass floor with a railing around it, and you can look down on top of it uh, from, I don't know, it's probably 12 feet ab above it or something like that. But a uh, very neat ex display. I'm saying all of this to tell you that I do not have a picture here of Peter's house. <laughs> huh? There's one in the book. But Marcia and I, when we went through picking out these pictures out of 700 pictures, trying to put a couple of hundred together for, for this portion of our trip, we missed getting a picture of, of that in there. But this is remnants uh, uh, from a synagogue, and this this may be back. This may be in the uh, sixth century or later. We don't know. But uh, here is a, a good a good display of the olive press uh, with millstones. Capernaum is north uh, of the Sea of Galilee. And it's mentioned 16 times in the New Testament. We know that Jesus is baptized while he's here. When we look at uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17, uh, Matthew 3 13 through 17 says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John and uh, to be baptized by him. John would, be, would have prevented him, prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus uh, it is written for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Uh, we know in the first part of chapter 4 here is where he's uh, tempted. Verse 1 in chapter 4 says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting forty days and nights, uh, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you uh, are the Son of God, 
command these stones to become loaves of bread. And we know what happens through there. Uh, Christ withstands that. And, and as we've talked several times, uh, he mentions it is written. He tells the tempter, it is written. And in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, it says, Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Matthew chapter 8 and verse, uh, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 27. No, I'm sorry, let's back up. Let's do Matthew 4, 23. 4, 23. Jesus also started to heal here, and he started to preach here. 4, 23 says, And he went through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, uh, epileptics, uh, paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him. We've got to remember a lot of the times when, when Christ would go to the mountaintop or Christ would get in a boat, there were people everywhere, large crowds. Jesus started putting his, or calling his disciples while he was here in, in, uh, in Galilee. Uh, Peter and, and Andrew and James and John in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 21. He called uh, Matthew in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9. Five others were uh, accounted for in Matthew chapter 10, verses 2 through 4. Philip is in John 1, 43. And Nathaniel's in John 1, verse 45. If we look, uh, Peter and Andrew and Philip were all from Bethsaida, which is right here in this area. One thing I want to look at while we've got the picture of the millstone up, let's turn to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Luke 17 verses 1 and 2. Christ is going to... We're, we're fixing to read some scripture where Christ is speaking very plainly. And this, these, are, these are times when we need to pay attention extra attention uh, because if, this, if what we're about to read in some of the uh, scripture we're going to finish this lesson up with here in just a little bit if you're not paying attention to it you're doomed uh, Matthew 17 verses 1 and 2 says and he said to his disciples the temptations of sin are sure to come sin are stumbling blocks but woe to the one to whom they come. Through, not to the one that they come, through the one that they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea uh, that he should cause any one of these little ones to sin or to stumble. Uh, these millstones, I don't know how many hundred pounds they would weigh, but you're not going to swim with one of them on. I can guarantee you that. We're looking here. We went through Magdala, and I'll tell you this. Arbel and Magdala, we didn't see uh, a lot of idol worship or things like that. But when we, 
when you get to these other cities. They fail to repent. Now you stop and think, uh, Christ spending as much time as he did up here healing, teaching, performing all kinds of miracles, and those in Capernaum and uh, uh, Bethsaida and uh, Charazin, which we're fixing to go to a after this uh, slide, they never turned away from their sinful ways. They fail to repent, even with all of the witnessing of all the things that they, they witnessed. I, you know, we've talked about that before, and I know in the young people's classes uh, through the years, we've talked about, would it be easier, would I be more faithful, would I be more apt to do what I'm supposed to do as a Christian, live the life I'm supposed to live, would it be easier for me to be a Christian if I lived during a time where I could have seen Christ perform miracles and heard Him teach? You know, just like we talked about last week, we take so much for granted that we get up and see every day. You know, would we find ourselves in the same shape as these people at Bethsaida uh, and Capernaum and uh, Charism. Charism was, uh, number one, they were uh, famous for their wheat. It, it was amazing the uh, crops uh, that were there, all, uh, fruit, nuts, uh, vegetables, um, beautiful pastures, beautiful cattle, I mean, it's uh, an agricultural uh, haven. Uh, so many archers. All of these stones that you'll look at in here, you'll notice they're a darker color. They're basalt. They're a, a lava rock. Uh, almost black, very dark gray. They were big on the uh, arches. You can see the arch here. This is an exterior of a home. Look at the interior of it, all of the archways. Uh, and in a very, a very uh, uh, fancy, must have been affluent people lived here. <laughs> Put this in here. These were called rock dogs. And uh, of course, anywhere you have tourists, I'm sure there's people always wanting to feed the animals, but they had warning signs up. Uh, don't feed the rock dogs, they will bite you. So we gave them, we, we saw some of them from a distance, but we gave them plenty of room. This was a building, evidently it was a, a, an olive, some kind of olive business because this is a remnant. You can see three uh, mills here uh, with these stones that they can, uh, uh, olive presses. Um, In the orchards. Okay, here's the, I think the next picture. Picture referred to as a high seat. Now this is the, the original that was dug up was, uh, of course, in a museum. But they, anytime they pull something up like this, whether it has a person's uh, name inscribed on it that's in the Bible or, or something like this, they they pour a cast uh, and make a replica to go out here for the tourists to see. But uh, uh, again, high seats, high places. This is a, a bathhouse here, a ritual bathhouse. And I'm just imagining that's, that's what those are representing as standing stones. Um, there's still digs going on here. You can see where they're covered up. Uh, it's a very important place during the time of Jesus in that first century. But by the middle of the third century, it's completely abandoned. No one's there. Uh, which uh, a lot of times is what happened 
when you when you saw a lot of the uh, pagan worship. <laughs> We've gone back and forth on this picture. This was taken off of the pier while we were uh, at night uh, at our hotel. Um, We think it's Magdala. We've called it Tiberius uh, in the past. By the way, Tiberius was built by uh, Herod Antipas. It was a city that he built uh, for Tiberius, the Roman emperor. And uh, of course, he was the one that beheaded uh, John the baptizer. But we've got to look and, and and realize all of these places we talked about up here where, where our, our Lord and Savior spent so much time, uh, walked many miles, rode, t took the boat rides in violent waters, uh, and these people witnessed that and still turned away. Uh, I want to look at Matthew chapter 11. We'll, we'll finish up with that. Matthew chapter 11. We're going to look at verses 20 through 24. Woe to the unrepentant cities. He's, he's fixing to call names. Read along with me, if you will. It says, then he, became, then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre or Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and uh, Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in, in Sid uh, Sodom, it would have renamed it in uh, Sodom. It would, <laughs> it would have rena remained until this day. Uh, but I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. You know, we've talked the last couple of Sunday mornings uh, about the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and, and what those, if you want to call them sulfur balls or whatever, uh, hot rocks falling out of the sky did to them. And Christ is telling them, that they've got a better chance than these three cities that he said is unrepentant after they'd witness, witnessed everything that, that he had done. Um, you know, we've, we've ended our last two sessions talking about us taking things for granted. Um, I want to plant a seed, or I, I, want to, I want to throw something out there that I'd like for you to think about, uh, because we're in a very important time uh, here in our congregation. What do you think the first century church looked like? What kind of people were obedient to the gospel in the first century? Who did Christ go to to teach? He went to anyone that would listen. But how many adulterers, fornicators, demon-possessed people? You know, he, he was there for the sick and the broken. Sometimes we look at ourselves, we need to be spit and polished or we're not what we need to be as a church. We look around, we need to be seeing 
people that's searching to fix things in their life, not perfect people. We sit in our pew sometimes thinking about how, how, and I'll go ahead and use it, how perfect we are. We are doing exactly what we need to be doing. When we need to be looking around going, I need to help this person. This person is here to find a way home. Here to make things right in their life. And that's where we need to be pressing. We need to take love our, love our neighbor, love our brother, and, and we need to take it to another level than what we have it right now. Uh, we're fixing to sing hymn number 153. And if, if there's a need, anyone has a need, 